So just as main effects tend to come in three different varieties, so for example, we can have a positive main effect where we have increased the strength of one independent variable, it increases the reaction of the dependent variable. So for example, the, the effect of heat on aggression, if you make a room hotter, people tend to act more aggressively. You can also have a negative effect where if you increase the strength of the independent variable, it actually decreases the reaction of the DV. So for example, the more outgroup friends you have, the less prejudice you have. And then also you can have a null effect. So for example, the effect of programs like the DARE program on drug use, where there actually hasn't ever been, a, at least in a controlled randomized study, any effect found of one or the other. Just because, uh, like there are three main types of maintenance effects, there are also three main types of interactions that we're going to talk about. Before we get to them, though, let's outline a simple study that we can look at with interactions. So let's say we're talking about the treatment of people with depression, and they're either treated with therapy or with medication or with both. So in this case, depression is on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being very severe depression. So for those who receive no therapy and no Prozac, no medication, their, ther their depression scores are probably going to remain very high if they're a depressive group. For those who are receiving only therapy, so in this case therapy but no medication, their treatment is probably likely to have a pretty big effect. In this case, they're going to be a 3 out of 10 on depression. And similarly, if they get medication but no therapy, again, they're probably going to have a pretty good effect. But usually what we find is people who receive both medication and therapy, they tend to yield the best effect of all. So we can take this type of data and graph it. And usually when graphing multiple independent variables like this, the easiest way is with a line graph. And so what we can do here is we can make a graph where on the horizontal line we plot one independent variable. In this case, people with no Prozac or no medication are going to be along this line of the graph. And people who have been given medication are going to be on this line of the graph. And then we're going to depict each group that received either no therapy or therapy with a different colored line. So for example, for those who never received any therapy, those who had no therapy and no Prozac had really high depressive scores. Those who had uh, no therapy but did have Prozac are going to have lower depressive scores. And similarly, when we plot people who've had therapy, those who have just had therapy but no medication fare just as well as those who had no therapy with medication. And those who got both, this group right here, fared the best of all. They had the lowest depressive scores. So when you look at these line graphs, you got to think each end of the line depicts a different group. Since we have two lines, and of course each line has one end and two ends, if you look at each opposite end, then you can infer that we have four groups here. One group over here, one group over here, one over here, and one over here. And you've combined, you figure out the qualities of the groups by combining what type of line it is, in this case it's a blue or green line, and what side of the graph it is. Uh, on, so with the no Prozac side or the Prozac side. So in this case, we could look for an interaction. Interaction is when the combination of conditions is not equal to the sum of its parts. In other words, you're getting a very different effect than you'd expect from the additive effects of therapy plus Prozac. When you combine them, you're getting something actually a little different than what you'd expect. And a nice way to look at this is to see if the main effects of each condition are different than the between cell effects. And what I mean by that is let's look at the main effect first of therapy. So to get the main effect of therapy, we actually have to average across the Prozac condition. So if we did that, if we looked at those who didn't receive therapy and the, are basically just across the entire group of those who received no therapy regardless of Prozac, so we average across the 10 of 3, we get an average depressive score of 6.5. Likewise, if we average across those who did receive therapy, regardless of Prozac, uh, 3 and a 2, we get an average of 2. The same thing, I, I made this a little simple, so it's the same thing uh, when we look at people who receive no Prozac, regardless of therapy, so an average of 10 and 3, and those who receive Prozac, regardless of therapy, an average of 3 and 2, or sorry, 3 and 1. So in this way, when we look at the average effect of medication, for example, what we're really doing is just looking at the difference between those who receive no medication and those who did receive medication. Again, averaged across the therapy conditions. In this case, we see a difference of 4.5. So people decreased on the depressive score by about 4.5 points. Likewise, and again, I did this just to make it a little simple. Let's say there was the exact same effect of therapy. That people with and without therapy showed a difference of 4.5 points. So then we can see, okay, those are the main effects of meds, the main effects of therapy, do they match with the between cell effects? And what I mean by that is just looking at between each cell. So in this case, those who went from no therapy, no Prozac, to no therapy, Prozac, showed a decrease of seven points, while those who went from no Prozac therapy to Prozac therapy only showed a decrease of two points, 
And in either way, these don't match the main effects of either medication or therapy. And again, just to simplify things, I made sure it was the other way around too. Those who went from no Prozac, no therapy to no Prozac therapy decreased seven points. And those who went from Prozac, no therapy to Prozac therapy decreased two points. So in this case, there is an interaction going on. The main effects don't uh, reflect the between cell effects. Let's say we had a different type of result and we can see that it actually applies the same way. So in this way, let's say we have the pretty common result that if you are taking Prozac and you have depression, you're going to get better or basically less depressive scores than if you're not taking Prozac and this group has no therapy. But let's say, and this is a bit of an unrealistic result, but let's just hypothesize that we find that if you combine Prozac and therapy, you actually get more depressive scores. So again, with just therapy, therapy, no Prozac, people's depressive scores went down. But as soon as you combine the two, you combine therapy and Prozac, for whatever reason, depressive scores go up. And of course, this isn't realistic, but let's just say that our, those are results. In this case, there's a very clear interaction going on. You're getting something with therapy and Prozac that you don't get with either one alone. So either one alone has a positive effect on depression, driving depression scores down. If you combine the two, it actually has the opposite, where it drives depressive scores up. So it's really easy to see this interaction in the table. So if we look at between, uh, between effects with the independent variables, we find that if we average across those who didn't receive therapy and those who did, we end up getting a five in both ways. To average across an eight and a two, you end up getting a five in both conditions. Same way if you average across those who didn't receive any Prozac and those did, again, you get five across. So in this way, we're actually seeing differences in main effects of therapy and meds being zero. Because again, we're averaging across the other conditions. So you're looking at the effect of Prozac regardless of therapy. So it is a balancing itself out. And of course, there are much more differences between the cells than zero. So if we look at the difference between each individual cell and the other, uh, basically the neighboring one, we get a difference of six. So this is very clearly a case of the main effects not adding up to the interactions or the between cell differences. So you might be wondering, what's it look like if there is no interaction? So in this case, let's say we have a result that's somewhat similar to our first one with, uh, with Prozac without therapy. Uh, you see de decreases in depressive scores. And again, with therapy, no Prozac, you see a decrease, but when you combine the two, you see an even greater decrease. So this is a very similar results to our first study. It just looks a little different in that basically there are equal increments going down with each one. So when people go from no therapy to either therapy or Prozac, they tend to decrease by about four points and then when you combine the two together, they tend to decrease another four points. So in this case, what it looks like when there's no interaction is again, you take the means for the effect of medications and the effect of therapy. And in both cases here, the effect of meds by itself, it's averaging across no Prozac to Prozac condition, shows a decrease of four points in depressive scale. And the same is true for the therapy scale. So those are our main effects of medication and therapy. And again, if you look at the between cell factors here, the between cell differences, you find the exact same thing. So going from a 10 to a six or 10 to a six equals uh, four, going from a six to a two or six to a two equals another difference of four. So in the case, there's no interaction going on. Basically the effect of medication is that people tend to decrease their uh, depression scores by about four. The effect of therapy also means they tend to decrease their uh, depression scores by about four. So if you combine the two, you end up decreasing them by about eight. So in other words, the additive effects of both of these equal exactly what you'd expect from the single effects of, of each of them. Whereas with an interaction, you're getting something that the total, that's something that's a little different than the sum of its parts. So like I said, so this is where there's no interaction, where the effect of therapy is decreasing in four, the effect of medication is decreasing in four. So when you add the two of them, you get a decrease in eight. So it's exactly what you expect by adding them up. Whereas an interaction is when the or conditions or each individual effect does not equal the sum total of its effects. And it's really easy to tell whether there's an interaction or not just by looking at line gra graphs depicting them. So if the lines are parallel to each other, there's never an interaction going on. And in fact, we can look at each of these and, and determine what effects, if there are one or two or no main effects going on, but in all cases, there's no interaction. So for example, if we're gonna look at like uh, this effect, we can see that there's a big effect from therapy to no therapy. So the therapies uh, are, getting, are denoted by two differently colored lines and the lines have a big separation. So there's a big difference in the depressive scores 
with people who didn't receive therapy versus those who did receive therapy. But since the lines are parallel and horizontal to the graph, we can find that there, or we can easily tell that there's no effective medication in this example. So if there was any effective medication, we should see that these lines are slanted in some way. Either that the no Prozac condition yielded lower depressive scores or that the Prozac condition uh, showed lower depressive scores. In this case, they're the same across. So we have one main effect and no, of course, no interaction because the lines are parallel. So the main effect for therapy, no effect for Prozac. Of course, this is different for this one in which the two lines are literally on top of each other. I didn't draw them exactly on top of each other because then they disappear. But in this case, there's no difference between people who didn't receive therapy and people who did receive therapy, these two different lines. But there's a big difference with medication. Those who didn't receive Prozac had higher depressive scores than those who did receive Prozac. So again, this is a main effect this time of Prozac, no effective therapy because the lines are touching, uh, but of course no interaction because they're parallel lines. And then finally, if there was no effect of either independent variable, then you would basically show no difference between the Prozac and no Prozac condition, so a flat line, and the two lines would be right on top of each other. Again, I didn't draw them literally on top of each other so that you could see both, but basically there's no difference between the therapy and no therapy condition, also no difference between the no Prozac and Prozac condition, and no interaction because the lines are perfectly parallel with each other. So if there are interactions, then the lines aren't going to be parallel with each other. So you could have it so that they're both in the same direction with one line being more steep than the other line. And sometimes you can have them actually in different orientations. So one line's going from bottom left to top right and the other is going from uh, top left to bottom right. And these are the different types of interactions going on. So an exponential interaction is when you see the effect going in the same way for each group. So in other words, you're seeing both lines and here going from top left to bottom right, but one is more steep than the other. So in this case, you know, this is something that seems like interaction. Of course, you'll have to run analysis to see if it's a significant interaction, if these two lines are non-parallel enough to denote a significant interaction. But either way, you know that you're probably going to get an interaction because these lines are at very different orientations. And the most clear example of an interaction is what's called an antagonistic interaction. And this is where the lines are in completely different orientations. This is also known as a crossover interaction because often the lines are actually crossing over each other like here. But you can still get an antagonistic interaction. Let's say you have a line right here and then another line below it down here. So they're not actually crossing over in the graph. They're sort of just lying one uh, above the other. That would still be an antagonistic interaction. That's why I like saying antagonistic interaction as opposed to crossover interaction because sometimes the lines don't literally cross over. But if they're in different orientations, here going from top left to bottom right or bottom left to top right, then you know you have an antagonistic interaction. So the advantages of doing experiments with more than one independent variable is that you can create experiments that more realistically match life, where you're being affected by many things at once. So for example, as an undergrad, I did a little study where I tried to determine what factors affect whether or not people own a dog. And I found that one factor, of course, is how much people like dogs, whether people grew up with dogs, whether they thought dogs were good, empathetic pets. But then another big factor is just did they live at an area where they could have a dog? So in this way, as with life, there are multiple factors affecting this dependent variable, whether or not people own a dog. In some cases, the desire to have a dog. In other cases, it's the ability or the uh, uh, sort of being able to live in a place where you can have a dog. Another thing I, I did as a grad student is I looked at what determined political attitudes, and I found lots of factors that affect political attitudes. Some of them are, of course, upbringing. Some are actually what area you grow up in, what type of friends you have, what type of personality you have, but there are lots of different factors that affect our political orientation. And then a few years ago, I had some students who were really interested, they were forensic psychologists, who were really interested in what makes someone a serial killer. Uh, of course, serial killers are very rare and it's hard to study them, but research has found that it does take a very certain particular concoction of independent variables to yield someone with that type of uh, personality profile. Uh, usually what it means is that someone had a really rough upbringing, maybe severe childhood abuse or neglect, and uh, some very distinct brain abnormalities, usually a real retardation in the growth of their frontal lobes, an example, uh, or uh, uh, particularly their ventral medial cortex, frontal lobes, uh, which connects emotions like empathy with their frontal lobe processes, like being able to interpret situations uh, and basically develop empathy towards people that they see and know. So in this case, oftentimes what affects us, what creates maybe a lifestyle choice like buying a dog 
or a personality type, a very extreme one like being a serial killer, is actually the result of really complex interactions between lots of different independent variables. So that's a big advantage is that we can make our experiments more realistic. Another big one is that we can test more complex theories. So for example, we could have a theory that suggestion creates false memories, but making it a little more complex, we could say, well, if suggestion comes from an expert, these false memories might be stronger, like we saw in the Elizabeth Loftus studies. Or for example, in looking at personality, now studies look at lots of factors that affect personality, not just our genes, not just our development in our brain and bodies, and not just our upbringing, but the combination of all three at once. And sometimes a combination can again yield something that you wouldn't expect just from the individual components. So it also allows us to test these more complex theories and find results that are sometimes quite surprising. The biggest disadvantage is that as you add more independent variables and more levels to these, your experiments get more costly. It requires more groups of participants. And as a rule of thumb, we usually like to have at least 30 participants per group. And also it can sometimes make uh, our results more difficult to interpret. So for example, let's say we were running a study and this seems simplistic with just three independent variables. It could be maybe gender, male, female, age, young, old, some other variable, I don't know, ethnicity, Hispanic, non-Hispanic on some dependent variable. Well, right there, you're already talking about two times two, four times two, eight, eight different groups of 30 participants. That means you have to collect at least 240 participants minimum with 30 representing each group. Let's say you add two other independent variables onto that, again, just two levels each. Suddenly you're talking about 32 groups. That's almost a thousand participants. And if you add just one level to each of those, then suddenly you're talking about collecting over 7,000 participants because you have 243 groups to fill. And that's just minimum. So this is why, or at least one of the reasons why we tend to keep our experiments relatively simple. We don't want to overexhaust our resources and having to collect all these specific groups of people. Another reason too is, of course, if you have too many levels, it can make your data difficult to interpret. So this is an example of, again, just two independent variables, a two-way interaction uh, that involves one where there's three groups, non-schizophrenics, paranoid schizophrenics, and disorganized schizophrenics, and then the other where it has four groups, these four different ethnicities. And already the results can get a little bit complicated. If you add in a third independent variable, then you have to depict your data either with two two-dimensional graphs or with an actual three-dimensional graph. It's usually better to represent as two 2D graphs just because you're probably going to be presenting it on a 2D surface unless you like make a physical model of your results or something like that that people can walk around and really look at. It's hard for to really represent it in a three-dimensional graph. And the most complex I've seen, and I think it gets a little ridiculous at this point, is if you look at a four-way interaction, so interaction between four independent variables and a dependent variable, you actually then have to use animation to depict your graph. So you can have three independent variables on the three axes the x, y, and z axis, and then the fourth independent variable you make across time. I'm not even going to attempt to explain these results because I think it's a little ridiculous, but this is again one reason why we really want to make our, our experiments a bit more simplistic just so that we can actually interpret the results and make sense of them. And of course there's no way to graphically depict a five-dimensional or five-way interaction with just one graph. So just as an overview, these factorial experiments are a really great thing because they can uncover more complex relationships. So you can see the interaction of more than one independent variable when you combine it with another. And this way you might end up finding something that's surprising, something that's more than just the sum of its parts.